And please allow me to have an introduction of our first panel discussion session for the whole GAP Summit 2022, Rethinking Food and the Environment. And today we are honored to invite uh, Heather Hancock, Master of uh, St. John's College at the University of uh, Cambridge as our panel chair, and Professor Sir Charles Gouffere, Director of the Oxford Martin School at the University of uh, uh, Oxford. And we have uh, Dr. Joshua Flack, the team lead at the Mozambique. And then we have uh, Christine Gott, the founder and the CEO at the Thought for Food. And what's more, we have uh, David Hughes, uh, our speaker today, uh, the head of the technology identification and evaluation at the Syngenta. And we also have uh, Ian Pigott, the managing partner for the Global Pharma Network. Please give your warm welcome to all our speaker and um, enjoy the session. Thank you. It's really lovely for us all to be here and to be kicking off the first debate session. I thought I'd give you a bit more uh, of a, a feel for the background that our uh, panellists are coming from, just so you might help you frame some of your questions as you, we're going through the session. Um, why am I here? Well, all my career has been involved in rural land and environmental management and in food and farming from a range of strategic policy and uh, business perspectives. And until last year, I chaired the UK's Food Safety Agency, the food regulator in this country. So Charles Godfrey, incredibly distinguished uh, scientist, professor of population biology, as you've heard, um, has always had an interest, a long interest in food security. He chaired the UK government's uh, foresight project on the future of food and farming. And until recently, he chaired the UK's agriculture and environment at Science Advisory Committee. Joshua, you've heard, scientific team leader at Mosa Meat. That's a Dutch biotech company which looks to commercialise cultured and cultivated meat. Christine is a global leader on agri-food tech innovation. She sits on the advisory committee of the UN Food Systems Summit and is the author of the book, The Changemaker's Guide to Feeding the Planet. It sounds like essential reading for everyone. Dave Hughes, Dr. Dave Hughes, a synthetic organic chemist who finished a postdoc position in the USA and moved into the UK agrochemical industry. As you heard, he's head of technology identification and evaluation for crop protection at Syngenta, and he works in strategic relationships with universities around the world in that role. And Ian Pickett runs a diversified farming business just 20 miles north of uh, London. And Ian's long been a pioneer in regenerative agriculture in the UK before it became a buzzword. Uh, he is a member of the Global Farmer Network and his farm is a demonstration farm for the leading UK body for sustainable food and farming. So that's a bit about our backgrounds. Well, it's hard to imagine a more vital need for revolutionary solutions to a crisis than that we face in farming and the environment. The world's losing productive land because of climate change, the population is growing, and generally what we choose to eat is not changing. And this is all exacerbated at the moment by a horrendous energy and in food production labour crisis. And that's all meaning one thing, we need to increase yields to meet demand with all the risks and negativities for the environment that might signal. Uh, the solutions that we need to harness need to combine biotech, innovation, producer capability and viability, and consumer appetite. We've only got an hour for an incredibly broad theme discussion. So to make the most of the wisdom and the insight on the panel, we're going to concentrate on two broad themes. We'll come on to looking at where biotech innovation might deliver the breakthroughs we need. But first, we're going to begin by looking at the opportunities and challenges facing resource distribution, food, and their relationship with the environment. And to kick us off, I'm going to ask Charles to begin, given his research and governmental insight, with something of a helicopter view. Thanks very much, Heather. And it's an enormous pleasure to be in Cambridge on such a, a nice late summer morning. We in Oxford consider Cambridge to be our first and most successful spinner <laughs> way, back, <laughs> way back in the 14th century. So it's very nice to be here. 
Uh, as Heather has said, the challenges for the global food system um, are just enormous. We will be needing to feed uh, between 10 and 11 billion people this century, and we'll need to feed them sustainably, equitably, and healthily. And I want to make two brief points. So I am uh, a huge techno-optimist and a fan in innovation. Um, and I say that genuinely, but I also say that if you look at the complexities of the food system, if you look at the challenges ahead, and it is possible just to throw up your arms and despair, despair. it's so complicated, so non-linear. It really is complicated, but it's also quite simple. And it's simple in the sense that we have to try and do everything. So we have to have difficult conversations about changing diets, which Heather knows so well from the FSA. We need to bear down on a waste. We need to do the wonky stuff around getting better food governance. And we need to produce more sustainably. And there's an enormous role for uh, innovation and tech in there. But it must be done with all these other things. Second point I, I wanted to make is that uh, innovation in the ag system, ag and food system, is nothing new. We've been doing it all the way back since antiquity. And there has been a refocusing of efforts over the last 10 and 20 years into not only increasing yields and productivity, which we need to do, but also doing, uh, making food more sustainable. And that just has to, to increase. We all talk about the green revolution. My colleague and friend at Imperial College, Gordon Conway, talks about the double green revolution. So we really have to do that. Um, and that is a challenge for the innovators. It's also a challenge for the policymakers because there are a lot of perverse incentives out there, regulatory, fiscal, etc., which makes it harder for innovators to do the right thing. Would prediction targets help? Help us get to a clearer, more achievable view about what we're using the land for, what we're expecting I'm from sorry, it. What targets? Production targets. Production targets. Um, yes and no. So I think it would be helpful. I think in the the UK government recently responded in a rather disappointing way to a draft food strategy, and in it it said that it wanted to maintain production in the UK at current levels. Um, which, as far as I'm aware, is the first time they've actually yeah. said something like that. And I think that's helpful. Uh, Ian, I'm sure you have a view on this, but uh, is that the right, um, is that the right um, goal to have? The world will need to produce, depending on the assumptions you make, 30 or 40% more food in the next 50 years. So should the UK be producing more food to help contribute to that? Or you could argue that we're a country that's destroyed a lot of our biodiversity. Perhaps we should be producing less food and building up our biodiversity. Now, I'm not sure what the answer is there. And this is a discussion we need to have in the political realm. So I think sort of production targets can be helpful for focusing that. Uh, um, that I worry a bit about production targets, which are then used as an argument for subsidies and things yeah. like that. Ian bring that all back down to, to people who are getting the sort of soil under their fingernails. How does this sort of situation affect farmers on the ground? How, do, how are they going to resolve this, this dilemma? Oh, gosh. Well, everything that Charles has just touched on is um, sort of flashing through my head as a farmer um, because we, the expectation of farmers in the UK has been, you need to do this three years ago, which is so different from what you need to do this year. Or, you know, so... Three years ago, the whole focus was, uh, was about it building our biodiversity and looking after the environment and public money for public good. And here we are, you know, uh, suddenly uh, with, with, with the intensive systems, not knowing if they are going to be able to continue because of the energy crisis that Heather talks about. Uh, and so we have got to be far more sustainable in what we do, um, but we have got to adopt more... Um, more science to help us do that in a way that we don't leave the environment behind. And myself, on, as, as a farmer, I'm a, an arable farmer, but you know, through regenerative systems, we are finding that we can embrace the environment and productivity, but we're certainly not, I wouldn't say we are achieving increased productivity with, with that, um, that practice. So if we need to do that, then we need to look at other methods. And one of the things I always observe in, in this, this difficult debate is um, whether consumers and retailers are walking the walk, or they'd like farmers, farmers and, and science, to come up with solutions, but they don't really want to step into taking their own responsibility. How's that looking from your perspective? Oh, well, I, I remember 
um, sat around a table a, about a week before we went into the first lockdown with all the leading buyers of the UK's leading supermarkets. And they unanimous, unanimously agreed that, that regenerative farming systems should be pre-competitive, meaning that they all do it because it's what we need to do for the, for the future of our planet. That is not happening. <laughs> Good answer. So, so, Dave, maybe you've got a different route into it. I mean, your business and, and the research collaborations that you're involved in, they're part of the answer. But how does the agrochemical industry, would you say, see the environment versus yield trade-off developing? It's a very interesting question. In fact, I, I don't see it as a trade-off because that rather presupposes that the sort of solutions that you would use to increase productivity necessarily have a bad impact on the environment and things that you do to improve the environment necessarily have a detrimental effect on productivity. Uh, and in the past, I think there may have been a correlation there, but today that's not necessarily true. You know, so for example, if you genetically modify a crop to make photosynthesis more efficient, that doesn't necessarily have a detrimental impact on the environment, but it does improve yields. Or precision agriculture, which enables you to put inputs exactly where they're needed in the field and nowhere else, improves the environment, but doesn't necessarily have an impact on yields. So those two things are decoupled now. I mean, if you think about uh, how this debate has been framed in the past as an adversarial conflict between two parties, there's the environmentalists who want to save the planet, and then there's the farmers and the industrialists who want to feed the world. I mean, what sort of choice is that? Saving the planet or feeding the world? It's obvious we have to do both, right? So it, it's, everybody wants the same thing. And so if we can just take the heat out of this debate and actually do what is best for producing food, I think, you know, the world will be a much better place. <laughs> Does that resonate with you and your experience? Oh, absolutely. So um, I run a global organization called Thought for Food, which works with millennial and Gen Z entrepreneurs in over 180 countries. And one of the things that, you know, in the decade that I've been running this organization that I've really observed is that today's young people are actually open-minded and ready to explore the nuance in these debates. At the same time, they're coming really with an attitude that's open to the possibilities and potential of technologies. They are the generation that are the most digitally savvy, globally minded, entrepreneurially minded generations. So when you, you know, look at these combined attributes, you see that they can be perfectly set up to address these large, complex, systemic challenges facing our food system in new ways. Um, and I really liked what you said about the fact that we need to actually innovate like biology does. We need everyone everywhere thinking about how to solve these problems all the time and to be bringing together diverse solutions. So we've talked about regenerative agriculture and you mentioned in the intro that there is a bit of buzzwords around this. But at the same time, if you look at like, this is finally a chance to talk about outcomes instead of you know how we do something. If you look at the potential of regenerative ag to be part of the climate solution and that we can start to bring GMOs and indigenous practices together, you know, enabled by uh, digital platforms, for example, to scale the impact, suddenly these trade-offs go away. And these are the types of combinations that asking hard questions, exploring nuance, and being open to combining things that have never been combined before can lead us to. And with that, I also am optimistic that we have a chance to feed 10 billion people by 2050. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's time to have these conversations and create the space for these solutions to come to life. And that's what we're trying to do. Christian, you've got a great window into some of the sort of uh, the big global institutional actors in this as well. Are they showing the agility and the uh, determination to to address this or are they a drag? I mean, we're in a, a circle of trust here. So I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be moving faster and with more agility. And this is something in the book that I wrote, The Changemaker's Guide to Feeding the Planet, I talk about, which is this entrepreneurial spirit that you can adopt even if you're not an entrepreneur. And it's being experimental and it's trying things to see what happens. And actually, in today's context where we have access to these profound technologies, you know, that allow us to build prototypes quickly, that allow us to connect with other people working on the same topic all over the world, you know, quickly, then we can do things in this spirit without losing a lot of money, time, and you know, taking on um, these types of risks. It's not to say, I mean, I'm definitely making it sound easier than it really is, um, but you know, I do think that if we can start to adopt a new mindset towards experimentation and collaboration, um, you know, we can maybe shift some of these entrenched systems that are filled with inertia 
And that's actually like a large part of like what my role is when I'm working with these institutional actors or with big companies or with farmers, by the way. We actually have in my um, program a whole like module around learning called WTF. And it stands for Where's the Farmer? And it actually is <laughs> equipping um, entrepreneurs, which by the way, you can't even believe how many people are building ag technologies and they've never talked to a farmer. So we're <laughs> equipping them with the like, here, go talk to a farmer and also talk to them in a way that like can build bridges and not, you know, you're, you can oftentimes speak two different languages. So this WTF module is like demystifying how to bring these worlds together. And, uh, and we're doing that with policy, we're doing that with science, and you know, we're also bringing the creative industries into this space. There's a whole realm for designers and artists and bio designers to come in and shape you know, narratives about what's possible and then get the you know, world to be thinking in that direction and building that. We have a real live entrepreneur. I know, I'm here. obsessed with Moza. Sure. This is a cool so company. So here you are, you're, you're <laughs> focusing down on a specific food group, alternative proteins, in your case, cultured meat. Um, how is all this playing out, this, this debate, in different geographies and cultures? Because you know, you're trying to have a kind of global impact. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd say I'm more of a scientist than an entrepreneur, but, but thanks, for, thanks for the compliment. Yeah, it, it's, a super, it's a super interesting question. And I think also um, one that goes back a little bit in your very first opening statement, Heather, you said that what we're eating isn't really changing. And in fact, I think it's even worse than that. In the developing or in more developing uh, nations, meat consumption is, is actually skyrocketing. It's going up. It's actually rising also in the West, but even faster in, uh, in developing nations. And yeah, meat sits at an, unfor an unfortunate uh, place in the Venn diagram, being both particularly tasty and particularly destructive to the environment. Um, so, th so, so I think the whole food system worldwide is creaking, but in the case of meat, it, it's already fundamentally very broken. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd, I think that, as Charles said, we have, to do it, we have to do everything. We can't carry on as we are. We can't replace all of meat consumption with alternative proteins like, like the cultured meat, lab-grown meat that, that I'm working on. Um, but maybe it can be a, you know, part of a constellation of solutions where you can reduce meat consumption you can replace a large proportion of protein consumption with methods which are you know, much more sustainable, much greener, require much less land use, which is a, a huge problem with, with meat production at the moment. Um, so yeah, how, how exactly that plays out across different countries is, is really nascent and remains to be seen, I guess. As, and as, I'm quite as interested in that sort of very, my, my old hat is, is, I mean, these advances are, are really rapid. But is the regulatory framework keeping up with them, or is that going to be a drag on, on their ability to be part of this change? Um, yeah, great question. It's very clear at the moment. I don't think that regulatory frameworks are keeping up. They're really coming into shape as the as the industry comes into shape. That, that being said, of course, you know, cultured meat is, is a hot topic, and, and lots of these other new exciting food groups are, are hot topics. But you know, they're a, a tiny speck in the in the actual sales at the moment. So I don't think it, it's an urgent problem that that the regulatory systems aren't going to be able to keep up. I think it's more of a case of can they be set up well or with enough forethought that they are going to serve the purpose when the science comes along to actually you know, bring these products to the market, which is you know, still, still a few years away when yeah. you come to... And do it in a way which, which sustains consumer trust, yeah. particularly in the face of the kind of the disproportionate, I suppose, concentration of financial and capital in this sector. Yep. Uh, which is, is probably a, a, a question there. Well, we've cut a lot of ground there, but let's talk about outcomes, because if we need to talk about outcomes and we're talking about biotech innovation, it has to be driven towards some kind of outcomes. What would you have on the list, anyone? What, what, what kind of outcomes would we try and frame? <laughs> you <can put. laughs> I just wanted to, because I think it relates to your question, but also on the regulatory question and the point we were talking about with kind of experimentation and entrepreneurial methods. Um, there are some bastions, particularly in the cell ag space, of um, kind of like leadership happening right now in Singapore, for example. So they've set a target, um, it's called the 30 by 30 initiative, to be 30% food secure by 2030. And they have their clear reasons why. Being an island nation, you know, they, do, they need to like find ways to address um, national food security and, and through innovation. And they've definitely prioritized three areas, aquaculture, cell-based meats, and um, alternative proteins. And by setting this outcome, they've also 
also built uh, like infrastructure that is attracting startups and investments and you know uh, bringing all of the players together including regulatory agencies so they've like really taken the lead in the world for the approval of cell-based meats and I think that there's some I you know if we if we watch from other markets and say, what you know, is this a blueprint? What can we learn from this that we can apply into our, you know, national food security um, agendas and set these targets, but then bring together all of the players and be brave and experimenting and how we can get to these targets. And so we're actually working now on helping to share some of those ideas and best practices and know-how with other parts of the world that are interested, for example, the Middle East, in driving their food security um, ambitions and looking towards some of these transformational technologies like cell ag and plant-based proteins and others that are going to require new regulatory mechanisms. Food security and outcome that others would sign up to? Would you have others on the list? Charles? So, yes and no. So there are two narratives around food security. One narrative which part of the industry um, still holds to is that we need to produce more food. We need to, in this country, our greatest food security in recent decades was in the 1980s. Uh, and that was when we really subsidised our, our agriculture in a wasteful way. So there's that type of uh, argument around food security, which I don't buy to. I think there then is a global argument about food security, which comes into, which has several components. One is resilience, and the other is how can we make certain that countries that have a food surplus can help a country that has a food deficit. So put, your, put yourself in the position of the Minister of Agriculture in Egypt. 100 million people at the moment, probably 200 million by the uh, en end of this century. There is no way you're going to produce that uh, on the strip of uh, fertile line along the Nile and a few, um, and a, a few oases. Tech will have some of the solutions for that, but we also need to have a global food system that uh, is able efficiently to, to redistribute food around the world. Now, if you look at what happened during the pandemic, there was some really quite good news there. There were the odd things that went wrong, but the global food system showed, in my view, surprising resilience to the, um, uh, to the pandemic. We're seeing complicated shocks now. So it, it's very strange what's happened. So after Russia invaded Ukraine, food prices shot up, but now commodity prices have come down to what they were before war. Now that's commodity price. The price you, you pay for food in the shops is high, but that's largely because of energy and, thing, and things like that. So um, we, we are going to go through a period over the next couple of years, I fear, and I hope I'm wrong, where food is going to suddenly rock up the political agenda. Um, I hope we don't take a sticking plaster approach. I hope we don't, I don't mean this in any cynical way, um, mm -hmm. waste a good crisis, and that we try and use that the focus on food to, um, to bring in solutions that will not only help in the next year or so, but will be positive going a decade into the future, decades into the future. Yeah, for, well, okay, from my perspective, uh, we have a, a momentous day coming up in just a few weeks' time. I think it's the 14th or 15th of November. It's 8 billion day. It's when the world's population will pass 8 billion for the first time. And as Charles has previously mentioned, we're heading towards 10 or 11 billion by the end of this century. We need to produce more food. At the same time, we need to shrink the agricultural footprint on the planet as well to create more space for things like uh, biodiversity, for carbon capture, things like that which means we need to produce more food from less land, and the land that we do farm needs to be farmed in a much more environmentally sustainable way. But we need to understand what we mean by sustainable. So what's unsustainable about our current farming practices? It's things like greenhouse gas emissions. It's things like pollution. It's things like the impact of biodiversity within the farmed environment. It's things like the quality of the soil. And the soil could be infertile for lots of different reasons, with lots of different causes and lots of different potential solutions. It's a complicated landscape. So the real question for me is, well, what are we going to do about those issues? How can we possibly achieve all of those things at the same time? It's not either or, it's at the same time. So there are lots of things that we could potentially do, lots of policy that needs to go alongside it, but I can't see a way we can do it without new science and technology coming through to help farmers achieve what they need to do. And the, the really good news is there's loads of new science and technology in lots of different areas that are being developed. And at least some of that 
is likely to come through and have a significant impact in the decades ahead. So I am, too, a, a techno-optimist. My Part of my job is to work out which horses to bet in this particular race, uh, which is not trivial at all. But overall, I'm optimistic that we can actually rise to this challenge. But Dave, you talked about your industry going through a huge pivot around this. What's, give us an example of one or two sort of things coming over the horizon that are getting you really excited. Um, OK, well, perhaps five years ago, we would have been interested broadly in two main areas, which would have been the genetic optimization of crops, GM crops and that kind of thing, breeding, and pest control. Today, I try and bundle the technology space within my remit into clusters. And there are 10 different clusters, one of which is pest control, one of which is genetic modification, and there are eight others. Things that are on the table these days that wouldn't have been on the table before. So we're actively exploring ways of th doing things like modeling ecosystems to work out how we can reduce bio, um, the impact of um, biodiversity, impact of farming on biodiversity, where you can put flower strips along the edge of a field in order to maximize the amount of biodiversity you get whilst minimising the area that's required to do so, things like that. It's a lot to do with modelling, a lot to do with understanding the systems and using that understanding to optimise those systems in ways that have never been possible before, using things like machine learning, using analytical techniques, using satellite imaging to actually understand the system better. And then there's a whole bunch of things around genetics, gene editing, I think is one of the, the perhaps the most exciting area at the moment. The reason being that once you've actually developed some kind of genetically modified crop, it's actually cheap and easy to scale. So I'll talk about things like automation, fully automated agriculture, so in other words, producing crops with no human input required because everything <coughs> is done by robots, that's, that's already possible, and is scaling at the moment. Um, but it requires large capital uh, infrastructure in order to do that, so that might be out of the range of many farmers around the world, whereas gene edited crops, if you just buy the seed, then you can sell. So uh, there's lots of, lots of different areas in which I think uh, it could be exciting. Could I challenge Dave yeah. brief, briefly? Well, I'd like to challenge you and then challenge us. So um, if you look at, uh, and let's talk about pest management, but we both have a background in it. Um, we still spray just a huge amount of toxic small molecules on farmland throughout the world and things. And we will need to continue to do that, certainly for the next um, decade or so. Um, but that cannot be sustainable into the future. And I'm well, not sure. Why not? I'd like, I'd, because I'd, it is I'd challenge so, in reverse. Well, because it is so toxic, and because we're understanding better the way that you're getting movement off, uh, off it. Now, it, maybe you can come up with better small molecules than we than than we have at the moment. But uh, I am not certain, and I completely buy everything you've just said about uh, um, about precision agriculture. I'm still not certain that the ag industry is quite aware of the challenges it will have to, to, uh, to meet um, feeding the global population healthily and sustainably. But then having said that, I think we all should challenge ourselves, especially those of us who uh, are in the environment movement, that in as much as we're challenged Dave and his industry to do new things, we have to think about some of our shibboleths. Um, I find that there is a certain almost sanctimoniousness in parts of the environmental community that we should continue to do, um, that, that we should continue to rule out certain things. And GM is one, you know, GM isn't a magic bullet, but can we really afford to throw away a tool such as that in a completely different area, nuclear? Can we really af afford not to throw away uh, nuclear um, and continue using um, uh, fossil fuels. So I think there's some real challenges both to all of us but also to the industry and I, I, I'd like to push the industry to go further and I'd like to push government to change some of the regulatory frameworks to make it easier for the industry, the private sector as a private sector, to do the right thing. I think to a certain extent you're also hampered by the regulatory framework within yeah. which you work. Uh, yes, well, you've, you've unpacked a lot of stuff there, Charles. Um, well, first of all, okay, uh, pesticides get a, a bad press. Small molecules, synthetic pesticides get a bad press. I mean, you describe them as being toxic. They're nowhere near as toxic as most people think. Right? They're, they're now less toxic than natural substances that are found in our food. So things like caffeine, for example. There's a famous case a couple of years ago uh, where a French company decided it would like to try and apply for a, the license to sell caffeine as an insecticide. You know, a farm, a, 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 Hobbyists know that if you use things like tea leaves or coffee grounds, they repel slugs. It's got a weak insecticidal effect. 
So uh, this company asked the European Union for a preliminary uh, opinion as to whether caffeine is likely to be registrable or not, thinking it's a foodstuff, it's safe. But the European Union came back and said it's too toxic. Caffeine is too toxic to be used as uh, a pesticide in Europe these days. None of the top 20 best-selling pesticides around the world is as toxic as vitamin D, which is, of course, an essential nutrient. So modern-day pesticides are much, much less toxic than most people think. Most people's per perception of uh, pesticides is anchored in what they were like back in the 1950s, 1960s, where things like DDT were being used. Now, DDT is an insecticide. It's horrible by today's standards, right? It's horrible, persistent, toxic. But DDT replaced lead arsenate as a pesticide. So imagine that, a pesticide containing arsenic and lead in the same compounds, you know? So acute toxicity, carcinogenic, neurotoxicity, neurotoxicity. So we've seen a steady evolution in pest control chemistry over the years to safer and safer and safer compounds. So I think pesticides get a bit of a bad press. In terms of the regulation, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, pest, uh, in terms of genetically modified crops in particular is a, is a frustration for me because the degree of regulation around that technology is way out of proportion to the risks that we now know about. And yet, it's really difficult, once those regulations have been put in place, to roll them back to a more rational position because it is seen politically to be making our food less safe. And no government is ever going to want to do that. So once those regulations are actually put in place, it's very difficult to turn the clock back. And we touched on regulatory incentives and others as uh, in Charles's comments. Ian, what, are we incentivising the right behaviour from farmers? How on earth do they navigate all this stuff about new technology? Are they ready for it? Do they understand it? Does it matter? Well, I, I've got to be careful I don't speak from a sort of parochial basis as a, as a UK farmer. But I, I, you know, I, I would, listening to what Dave and Charles have said, you know, uh, in, a, in a regenerative system, um, we would like to step away from our dependency on, on insecticides and, and pesticides. So, and the reason the majority of farmers have adopted that as a system is, is realising that a dependency on, on too much um, inorganic fertiliser or on pesticides, um, our soil has got, has got exhausted. So, so we don't use any insecticide. We try and use um, much less fungicide and herbicide only when necessary. And I would say that that has to be a, a progression that, that we all need to adopt as farmers around the globe because our soils, the biology in our soil is the most precious thing that we have. And we need to find ways of adopting science to look after and promote that. And I'm not saying that, that you know, the ag chem sector can't do that, but biostimulants and way of really uh, making sure that, you know, we, a, a good analogy is that I, I, when I talk to children about farming, we, I make the comparisons with the soil to your own gut. You know, if your gut isn't healthy, you're unlikely to be healthy, and the soil is the same. So I do think, I do think that the government is trying to find ways to adopt regenerative farming systems and finding ways to incentivize farmers to learn more. But, um, Charles, you alluded to it earlier, you know, when you suddenly have huge commodity price spikes, you know, people, th they throw these, these new ambitions out the window because they see the dollar sign. And that's, um, and it, that short-termism is, is, is very, f going to take us down the wrong path very quickly. Well, I hope all that stimulated some questions. Who'd like to start us off? There's somebody up here. Do you please say your name? Um, Hi, uh, I'm Donica. I'm a PhD student at EMBL in Heidelberg. Um, really interesting discussion. Um, but one point that came to mind was um, thinking about like increasing production for growing population as well as sustaining the environment. Like, the, by far the biggest population growth this century will be in sub-Saharan Africa. So going from like one billion to over three billion by the end of the century, and of course they'll have a huge amount of economic growth during this time, but it'll also still be playing catch up with much of the developed world. So I'm wondering if like, these technologies which are being developed to um, increase productivity while also protecting the environment, will they be, prim like they might primarily be developed in climates of the developed world, but not necessarily as applicable to, um, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa. Like, do you think that this is the case or is this worry legit? Um, maybe we can start with Ian <laughs> uh, about, yeah. Well, I, I would, um, uh, it's a really good question, and I, I would say 
from my involvement with uh, the Global Farmer Network. So we, we, we talk to farmers, or, you know, we have a network of farmers around the world, so from Sub-Saharan Africa to, you know, South America, North America, you, you name it. And, and I actually, and this, isn't fr this is just an anecdotal um, sort of feedback from what the, 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 the improvements that, that, that we are getting from biotech in the likes of Sub-Saharan Africa, the work of Gordon Conway, <clears throat> we're seeing huge benefits there, and, and I hope that would be, you would agree with that. You know, so making uh, or adopting varieties that are more drought tolerant, that, that are more uh, nutritionally dense for those climates. I think that perhaps is more, is, is more attainable than some of the stuff we're trying to do in, in these more developed nations. Is that fair? Yeah, no, I very much agree with, agree with that. Just a very quick comment on population. You're right to mention population. The news around population is pretty good. Um, the rate of increase is decelerating. We will see population growth throughout the century, but most of that is, is people living longer. And global fertility will hit 2.1 by mid-century. So um, one of the reasons as a population biologist I'm much more uh, optimistic now than when I was a, a student is because of that. You can begin to see a, a, a time when the demands of the global population on the earth is, is, is going to asymptote and, and go down. Sub-Saharan Africa is so critical. We cannot lecture people who are hungry about sustainability and things like that. So it is absolutely critical. I talk about the need to eat less meat. That applies to us in the rich world. It doesn't apply to a pastoralist in the Sahel or something like that. Uh, we've both mentioned that this wonderful man, Gordon Conway, he spent his career talking about appropriate agriculture, uh, appropriate innovation for sub-Saharan Africa. He has a lovely um, slide of precision agriculture, which is divided in two. One is a tractor from around here, where the cab looks like the bridge of the Star Trek, Star Trek Enterprise. And the other is microdosing. So you give people the knowledge to take a tiny bit of fertilizer and a little capital, uh, the capital to do it, fill up the top of a Coke bottle and put it at the base of a, um, a uh, maize plant. So a really simple bit of, um, of human capital there and has um, really amazing uh, uh, results. So really critical, but it has to be appropriate. And there is the opportunity for sub-Saharan Africa to leapfrog some of the mistakes we've made in the West. We've already seen leapfrogging. There'll never be landlines over most of Africa. And there are the equivalent that one can do in the ag sector. Of course, an ageing population globally is a reduction in agricultural workforce, which is a labour-intensive sector already in many countries. So that's another incentive yeah. to, to get this right. Does anybody else want to come in on that? Or yeah, just, just quickly, just to, to build on what Charles was saying, I mean, we're already seeing uh, high-tech approaches to plant breeding being used in Africa by African scientists to benefit African agriculture. Genetically modified cowpea, I think it was. <laughs> Uh, has recently been approved. And banana. And, and banana, of course, yeah. So, so this, this leapfrogging effect, I mean, once you've developed a new technology, it's easy to apply that new technology to new contexts rather than just simply applying something completely different. So, so we are seeing benefits. You're right, though. I mean, some technologies will be appropriate, some will not. But hopefully that's no reason not to do them in the first place. We'll have another question. There are several hands over here. Yeah. Just pick a hand. <laughs> <laughs> this lady here on, on the fourth row. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the panel discussion. It was really interesting. Uh, my name is Este. I'm a master's student in EPFL and ONS de Lyon. And I have one question that is really puzzling me since many months now. I don't have the answer. I would like to see your opinion, maybe more for Professor Charles Cotfrey. Uh, it is about we see that we have many people uh, on the planet in the next years. Uh, as you were saying, so the fertility will increase too. My question is now, should we restrict bus in some countries or not? I don't know what to say because for me, we, I do not have the right to tell people what, how many children they can have. And at the same time, uh, if we can solve the problem to 2050 or foot, maybe we cannot in 2100 just because we'll have too many people. So what do you think? Do we have the right to say something about that? I'll let Charles pick that up. So thanks very much. And I was at EPFL last week, which is a wonderful uh, uh, food campus. Um, so no, I don't think we, we need to do that. There is a really positive story around population. So population has been something that people haven't wanted to talk about. 
And it's a non-coercive message. If we bring people out of poverty, which is a good thing, if we provide education for children, which is a good thing, especially girls, if we provide access to reproductive health care, which is a good thing, then, and it's a wonderful get-out-of-jail card, the demographic transition happens. This is something that was not predicted. So the Malthusian idea is that inevitably population will uh, outgrow our ability to food it. Uh, to, to feed a population. We just have to do the right things on those three. Poverty, education, reproductive health care. Excellent. Uh, someone on the back row uh, at the right here. Hi, uh, I'm Milena. So I work in the horizon scanning team at the Food Standards Agency. Um, and I uh, have really enjoyed this conversation. This is like what our team talks about all the time. Um, and um, my main question is, one of the big things we've been thinking about is how do we make food more um, healthy and sustain sustainable, but keep it affordable, particularly thinking about the um, kind of cost of living crisis at the moment. How do we make sure that we don't create this double kind of food system where we have people who can afford to eat healthily and sustainably and people who can't? Um, and what, what are your thoughts on that? Josh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a great question and a very important one. Obviously, uh, we're trying to make a new food, and so we're very interested in asking people, uh, potential consumers, what they think about it, and also um, alludes to the point that Ian made a little bit. No matter how exciting or exotic the cultured meat might seem right now, the, the main thing that people decide on in the supermarkets is price and taste. So these are overwhelmingly the, the main factors, and so that has to drive the development of, uh, of new food products and of yeah, adjustments to the, to the current food products. From a, from a cultured meat perspective, the long-term outlook is good, of course. Cows, and especially cows, but, but other animals as well, are extremely inefficient at turning uh, the calories they eat into calories that we can eat. The cells themselves are much better at it. So um, on a long term, it can be feasible. Uh, of course, the, the, the meat industry currently in this country, especially, but, but worldwide is very heavily subsidized. So when those subsidies eventually kind of peter away, meat will, traditional meat will become much closer to what its actual price should be. And we would hope that our technology could become um, competitive with that. And I'm not talking about three years or five years, I'm talking about 10 or 20 or, or more years. Um, so it's not going to fill this fill the gap right now but um yeah it, it's a great question and i think hopefully scientific advance can really help us to make food products which are cost competitive because yeah ultimately there's yeah we, we cannot preach to people or you, you cannot rely on people's sentiments or values to um, override buying decisions especially in a cost of living crisis type situation so I, mean, <clears throat> I have a couple of reactions. I think it's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here, um, and it's a great question to be asking, especially like right now when we are experiencing food inflation pretty much across the board. And so I do think there are some innovative mechanisms, again, in the spirit of like how we can find blueprints from, you know, different experiments happening in different places and learn from them. And so one example in the US is around the food as medicine concept where actually there are insurance companies coming in and um, providing like lower premiums for people who go to a new type of pharmacy, an actual like farm see where they can procure healthy local uh, nutritious food that's produced um, and that's really interesting for some you know people who are also in food deserts because they're building these ac uh, access points in places you know where people typically wouldn't have access to healthy nutritious food um, I think another you know thing that's becoming all the rage right now in the world of policy and at the UN level is true cost accounting and you alluded to this that right now uh, we're not actually building in the price of externalities into our food. And so where, who pays, right? And it can't be pushed onto the consumer. There's a lot of evidence, you know, especially in developed markets that millennials and Gen Zs are willing to put their money where their mouth is and pay premiums on products that align with their value systems. But this is not a sustainable like method going forward. So what it is really exciting for me is to see new types of market mechanisms being introduced. For example, 
carbon farming right now is, is kind of a new way to fund the transition towards regenerative ag. There is a period of time we've been putting so many fertilizers and chemicals on our soils that we need to replenish them. And it takes about five to seven years actually to like really you know, bring back all of that soil biodiversity and microorganisms that allows regenerative ag to reach those productivity levels that we need it to. Um, and so right now the carbon market is coming in. Now it's not working perfectly, but there are some interesting data points that can come out there. And you know, I, I definitely feel like there are, are these types of new experiments where um, ecosystem services you know, are now being put into the market mechanism. And this will help to ensure that there's gonna be um, more value shared and more uh, costs shared across the board. So it's not always pushed to the consumer or to the tech provider, you know, or worse, to the farmer, you know, because they're often the ones that have to take on all the risk and all the costs, so. Very, very quick comment. Um, it, within this circle of trust here, there, <laughs> I have to admit, there are a few things I get quite grumpy about. And one of them is healthy food. I don't think there's anything any such thing as healthy food. There's only healthy diets, right? That's you right. can't analyze a food in the absence of its dietary context. I'll give you an example of this. So recently in Japan, uh, a new variety of tomato was produced which has high levels of gamma aminobutyric acid in it. Mm -hmm. And this is a natural chemical that has uh, the effect of lowering blood pressure. And it's been sold as, a, as one of the first high-tech functional foods. It's produced by gene editing, I think. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, to my mind, it all depends on the dose at which the gamma aminobutyric acid is actually taken. So you've got to get the dose actually right. What if you eat too many tomatoes? I mean, how far down do you want your blood pressure to go? Is that a good thing? If, it, if it's not under the control of a doctor, I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit risky, isn't it? And what if you eat just one tomato? Does it have any effect at all? So without the dietary context, I think it's really difficult to evaluate whether a food is healthy or not. You just have to have a healthy diet, yes or no, rather than just a healthy food. One of the things I, I'd observe, and I love the WTF, where's the farmer, but quite often in these conversations, WTC, where's the consumer, yeah. really matters as well. And, and uh, when I was in, in uh, the Food Standards Agency, it used to be incredibly hard for the uh, regulator to get in the room with tech and, uh, and, and the kind of the research base uh, of biotech and agriculture. And if you're not there at the beginning, you don't help map out the way that some of the challenges that might get in the way of great uh, uh, innovation, whether it's in environmental improvements and the feed through to food quality or in foodstuffs themselves. So I think that's the thing that really matters. It's all systemic issue and, and that's still a, a problem in, the, in this country. And I think another thing that gets in the way is the national taste buds, which is a bit to your point. In this country, the national taste bud is very keen on salt and sugar. And you have to really work very hard over a long period of time to change the national taste, but otherwise you will have a two-tier system because cheap food is full of salt and sugar and more expensive food tends not to be so ultra-processed and is, has a, a, a probably a, a better nutrient profile, we might say, as well. So unless you can overcome over time and change the national taste... Um, in a very, uh, and you need all the actors involved. Finland did it incredibly effectively in changing the national diet to deal with what everybody recognised was an absolute crisis in terms of uh, particularly obesity and heart disease, heart disease especially. Um, but they did it because business was involved and education was involved, as well as the government was involved, as well as retailers and producers were involved. So that's the kind of thing we need to, to do as well. And the FSA was brilliant doing that in, 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 in SALT, but um, political commitment to these sorts of things is usually incredibly weak. Nobody Can wishes to in? tell someone. Yeah. So, sorry, j just to, uh, the, the, the example of Finland is an extraordinary example. I mean, they yeah. really did change uh, diets there. And you're right, everyone was involved. But there was also political courage there. Political courage, yeah. And partly because it was so clear the health damage of food, then um, the politicians were allowed to be brave by what the public were allowing them to do. So we want braver politicians, but that's partly our fault as well. And I don't normally quote Jean-Claude Juncker, the uh, European <coughs> president, but he said something very wise. Often we, the politicians, know what to do. What we don't know is how to get elected once we've done it. So it's partly our role um, to legitimize, g give the political weather a, in which the politicians can be brave. Having said that, we also need braver politicians. 
Let's have a... I think we've got time for one more question, have we? We've got five minutes. We might manage to. A brave one. Who's got a brave question? <laughs> uh, there's somebody in the middle waving, say she's got a brave question. This lady here with the glasses. <laughs> and now I've bigged up your question. I'm sorry. No pressure. So, I'm Luisa. I'm a PhD student in south of Brazil. So, yes, I do have a challenging question. <laughs> I, I love the discussion, the panel, but I think this was a, very, a perspective from uh, people from developed country with uh, little landscapes for production. So, you were like highly inno innovation because you need more food. So, but we do have lands, a uh, lot of lands. And I have um, like a quite interesting data here for you that I searched during your conversations. 75% uh, of all the food Brazilians eat daily is produced by a familiar agriculture. And this uses 23% of agricultural lands. The other 75, 77% of uh, agricultural lands is mainly used for producing soy for exportation. So, uh, and still we are on, on a hunger map Again, so uh, my point is, isn't it more than just innovation? Because we have like very high tech agriculture and it's a country very strong in agriculture, but isn't it more like about good policies and our relationship with food, like changing the way we people uh, relate and eat and uh, consume? I mean, um, most of the soy that we produce is not used for feeding people, it's used for feeding animals. If we weren't eating animals, uh, we could be eating uh, other products produced in these huge lands that are being used for producing soy. I mean, uh, don't you think we should maybe changing, change a little bit our approach when talking about food and feeding than just like high tech and GMOs or, I don't know, new types of food? Uh, uh, thank you, I think this is my question. I mean, that's the point I was trying to make right at the beginning. So, so all the tech is really, really exciting, but we have to do everything. Exactly. <clears throat> uh, Christine and then Ian. Well, I, I just also wanted to re-emphasize the point about how we can combine technology with systemic approaches. So when we are looking at how to address these complex challenges, I work a lot in Brazil. It's one of our most active communities, actually. And we funded many companies working with indigenous people in the arc of deforestation. With um, We funded an um, ag tech company that's working with smallholder family farms, actually, to help them make better decisions on which inputs to use, how to be more sustainable, and become more regenerative. Um, we work with Renature, which is like helping uh, with agroforestry. And these types of solutions are not, you know, going into this old paradigm that technology is bad, sustainability is good. They're combining them in exciting new ways. And this is the type of conversation that we need to be having is like, how can we bring GMOs into the hands of, you know, small innovators in you know every region of the world how can we combine ancient wisdom and indigenous practices with modern GIS technologies these are these are where we have the chance to go and this is what when I'm talking about innovation what I mean it's not just high-tech you know VC funded innovation that's something we need but we need to combine it with the types of goals and the types of practices that can make a difference for more people everywhere um, I'd just I'd make two very quick points. The first is um, I've been involved in trying to reconnect young people with food and farming and healthy eating for about 25 years. And it is incredibly difficult. It moves at glacial pace. And I completely agree with you that we do need to, we need to completely address that, that we need to, people to understand how to value food. In the UK, we're five generations removed from the land. People don't make an, an association with where the food comes from and the food they eat. So that's one issue. The second thing that I just want to say is that there was a report written in 2019 called the Rethink X report um, that basically talks about synthetic fermentation and precision fermentation. To me as a farmer, that technology, which is your world, Josh, you know, if, if, you, could fer if you could precision uh, fermentate milk, then you, you would completely change the way agriculture occurs across the planet because you wouldn't need to feed dairy cows, you know, so all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, all those dairy cows that go into the meat industry, that would, it would, it would transfer, and apparently that's going to happen by 2035. We're finishing on a very exciting note there. <laughs> <laughs> did you save that up? So I did. Big, yeah. big, big, big. <laughs> Excellent. Look, we've run out of time. 
Um, so I'm sorry we can't answer all your questions, but what an interesting discussion. Thank you to the whole panel for bringing so many different perspectives uh, into the room. Uh, thank you for your interest. I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the sessions today. Thank you.